Welcome to the Dance NYC bi-weekly field-wide call. Excuse me, it's not bi-weekly anymore. We're moving to monthly, spoiler alert. Um, I'm Sarah, research and advocacy assistant. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm coming to you from Muncie Lenape land, uh, currently known as Upper Manhattan. I'm a non-disabled mixed heritage Latinx cisgender woman with short, dark hair. I'm wearing a black shirt, gold hoop earrings, and I'm sitting in front of a light colored wood background. I am joined today by Izzy Dow, Programs Coordinator for Dance NYC. Hey, Izzy. Um, a note that today's call is being recorded and the recording will be published on Dance NYC's YouTube page next week for your reference. We have ASL interpreters Maria and Candice from Sign Nexus with us today. We thank them for their services and partnership. A note that we'll always have an ASL interpreter visible on the call and they'll switch out every 15 to 20 minutes or so. Um, we'll carry on as usual, but just naming that you'll notice this. Live captioning is also available today. Our captioner is Bonnie, also from Sign Nexus. You can use the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom screen to view captions. And we'll drop a link in the chat to access the stream text, stream text transcript. Um, a general note to please be clear and loud and maintain a moderate pace while speaking to help our interpreters and captioner. Some housekeeping elements, please stay muted unless you're speaking. And if you are speaking, please introduce yourself and your organization. If you're on camera, please give a brief visual description for accessibility purposes, as I did earlier. If you have a question, you're welcome to put it into the chat or raise your hand or unmute and share it with the group at any reasonable time in the conversation. If you'd like to ask anonymously, you can message any of the Dance NYC staff on the call. Um, if you have any questions or concerns about using Zoom or require technical assistance, you can also message me or Izzy. A reminder that we use the running agenda to take notes during the meeting, and we have a lot of resources collated in the fieldwide call FAQs document. So we'll drop some links to those in the chat now. We'll also drop some community guidelines into the chat for you to read and reflect and let us know if you have any questions about those guidelines. Moving on to our acknowledgements, Dance NYC would like to recognize our country's, uh, ooh, sorry, our country's history and its legacy in the space we occupy. Parts of this acknowledgement have been adapted from the guidance of indigenous dance artist and activist, Emily Johnson, who worked on Dance NYC's broader land acknowledgement. I would like to acknowledge that the city of New York is on stolen land, more specifically Lenape Hoking, the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, who are also recognized federally as the Delaware Nation of Oklahoma, Anadarko, Oklahoma, Delaware Tribe of Indians, Bartlesville, Oklahoma, Stockbridge, Muncie Community, Bowler, Wisconsin, and in Canada, Muncie, Delaware Nation, Moravian of the Thames First Nation, and Delaware of Six Nations. We recognize that as an organization based in New York City, we have benefited and continue to benefit from the systemic displacement and subsequent erasure of Lenape people and governance on their land. Please join me in taking a moment to recognize and reflect on the centuries of violence, displacement, forced migration and settlement here, as well as the centuries of resilience and leadership of all indigenous and First Nations peoples on Turtle Island that have led to our livelihoods in New York City today. Thank you. We also acknowledge and mourn all the people whose lives have been lost to COVID-19 and those whose lives have been taken by the actions of white people, institutions, and systems, and the many accomplices, witnesses, and beneficiaries of white supremacy 
who have actively participated in or stood by and observed in silence. Please take another moment with me now. Thank you. And we've dropped a resource in the chat for you to find the native land that you occupy. All right, so moving into the meat of the call here, we're excited to take this opportunity to explore the reopening dance in NYC digital toolkit. Um, I'll start by taking you through some of the pages on uh, the website. And then we have guest speakers, Jenny Thompson from Give Me Dance and Tamara Kashecki from the New York Independent Venue Association. They'll share some experiences and resources with us. Before we get to that, um, in order to maximize our time together, our resources, events, and advocacy updates that we typically share on this call will be shared in the follow-up email tomorrow. You can also find most of those resources in um, the agenda document that we dropped in the chat earlier. Um, for additional resources, you can also check out Dance NYC's weekly resource roundup in our Instagram stories on Thursdays. And for advocacy updates, you can refer to Dance NYC's frequently updated advocacy page. So we'll drop links to both our Instagram profile and our advocacy page for you to reference at any time. Um, we're sort of shifting some of the format of these calls to um, direct them a little bit more toward guest speakers and resources and shifting some of the resource sharing to the follow-up email and to other um, departments and um, venues within Dance and Lycee's offerings. But one advocacy item that I'll share with you today is the opportunity to submit written testimony on behalf of arts workers to the US House Small Business Committee. This committee held a historic hearing yesterday on the power, the peril, and the promise of the creative economy. It was really the first hearing of its kind, and um, it's really valuable to offer your testimony of your experiences as an arts worker. The hearing record is open through February 3rd, so there's still time to submit testimony. We'll drop some links in the chat so that you can learn more about the hearing. You can even revisit the recording on YouTube. Um, there's a social media toolkit from Arts Workers United, um, and you can submit your testimony directly to your representatives using a couple of sign-on platforms. Dance Rising has a sign-on testimony template, and New Yorkers for Culture and Arts has a sign-on letter as well. So we'll drop links to that. Dance NYC, myself specifically, has also been drafting testimony, and we will publish and promote that um, beginning next week. So keep an eye on that advocacy push. It's really important for our sector. All right, so now, a sip of water. I'll do a short screen share navigation of our reopening toolkit website and show you some of the features on the pages. Um, there's a lot of information in this toolkit that's gathered from many sources over the past year or more. So I won't go into like super specifics. Um, I'll note also from the top that Dance NYC provides this website for general informational purposes for the dance sector. We don't necessarily endorse recommendations or practices of specific organizations. So this site is really meant to be a tool and a resource for organizations and dance workers um, to assess all the information at hand, right? We know that a lot of information with COVID is rapidly changing and it compiles over time. So it gives you a broad view of this information from government mandates to other enhanced safety measures. And from there, you can make your own judgments and decisions as to the best practices to suit your circumstances and your communities. Um, so all of that said, let me initiate some screen share. Give me a moment. All right, here we are. So you'll see similar to what I 
just said, there's a disclaimer, pops up when you come to this website. Reopening Dance in NYC, the digital toolkit. We have a nice color scheme, turquoise um, and dark purple. Gives you an overview here on the homepage to get started of um, just some of the important pieces and components of the site. Um, one of the new pages that's been added recently in this latest round of updates is the news and updates page. So this page will give you um, links to press releases and other kinds of news items from various important sources. And so this is sorted by federal organizations. So CDC, FDA, White House, state sources, the governor, governor's office, and the New York State Department of Health. And then at the city level from the mayor's office, the New York City Department of Health. And we have a COVID-19 tracker from the city. Um, that's also very helpful if you want to track numbers and things like that in your local jurisdiction. Um, so that's our news and updates page. It will be updated fairly frequently so that um, we're able to get the most timely and pertinent information out to the community. Um, all right, so moving on to standard recommendations. This, uh, well, I'll start here in the general summary. The general summary page is, as the title might indicate, a summary of the standard recommendations, which is sort of the largest text component of this website. Um, just updated it today. Um, and you can see it's formatted as a table. So let me zoom in a little bit. There we go. Um, and it starts off here with risk profiles, right? The things that are considered higher risk activities, moderate risk, and lower risk activities. Some examples in this column. And then we go on to some further recommendations per topic area. So in each topic area, which is here in the left-hand side, we have uh, mandatory, so things that are fall under state, local, or federal mandates, and then best practices, which are things that are indicated for enhanced safety, for accessibility, and for equitable imp implementation of policies within your organizations and operations. Um, so some of the topic areas include vaccination, physical distancing, on-site activity, protective equipment, hygiene, cleaning, and disinfection, communications, screening and testing. So that's the general summary. And that can give you kind of an overview of the key points, general points within this much larger document, our standard recommendations. So like I said, standard recommendations, this is a lot of material. Um, it is sorted into four main categories, people, places, processes, and operator and employer plans. Um, each of these pages starts off with government mandates. We figured moving those things to the top can help folks know what they need to be in compliance to avoid non-compliance um, fines and fees and things like that at all levels. And um, the top two elements in government mandates at this moment are the local Key to NYC program and the New York State HERO Act. So those are pulled up to the top in many of these pages that we'll walk through. Um, and with a note that I think this note is fairly important, that responsible parties should be prepared to adjust and adapt as we know, and as we've been experiencing through this Omicron surge, that um, there is a level of adaptation that needs to be taken into account in addition to mandates and um, current practices. So that's one of the purposes of this site as well. Um, also at the top of many of these pages is this note on equity. Um, this was drafted um, in part by our contractors who have specifically had an eye to um, equitable implementation of reopening protocols for um, immigrant and disabled dance workers. Um, so this is something that you can also um, consider as an integral part of 
how you draft and implement your protocols within an organization or how you navigate them as an individual. Um, that's all that I'll go through and the standard recommendations. It's a lot of material. We're also considering you know, ways that we could organize it to be a bit more navigable and accessible. So please reach out to me if you have any uh, feedback on any of this. But I'll move on now to our dance field scenarios. These are crafted specifically for the dance field. Um, and you can see here that there is a whole list of different um, kind of occupations and situations in the dance industry. Um, and each of these pages has specific recommendations that are pulled out mostly from the standard recommendations and customized to the needs um, and like scope of work within these different communities, right? So if you're managing a dance company, you might have some different concerns than independent dance workers, dance teachers as well, office-based dance workers, that's definitely kind of a specialized zone that um, falls outside of like studio and performance venue-based activity. Um, we have dance studio managers, in addition to visitors and renters. Same thing with dance presenters and venues. We also have venue visitors and renters. Um, so each of these field scenarios, I'll move into one of them. Um, they're each classified in the same way as the standard recommendations. People, places, processes, plans, some alliteration going on there, um, and starting off with our government mandates and um, note on equity. And you know, within each of these categories are sort of subcategories about like vaccination and testing, distancing, cleaning and disinfection, some of those top level categories that were in the general summary as well. Um, very much related to mandates um, and operations specifically within organizations is this posters and templates page. And again, we've drawn out government mandates at the top. Um, many of these links are direct links to PDFs that you can download and post as posters within your space. Um, there is a required poster for businesses through Key to NYC and also a recommended template. Some other flyers and things like that so that you don't have to spend your valuable time creating organization specific materials when there are things that are existing for say entertainment and fitness. Um, these can be both for like external facing, client facing um, areas and for internal um, staff reference and things like that too. Same with the New York Hero Act. Um, there's a recommended template for your required um, business plan um, for exposure prevention. And then some other frequently asked questions and things like that, general signage, um, masking and resources, um, even things like floor decals and social distancing tape. Um, if you need to mark out your studio for people to navigate better, like entrance and exits, arrow decals and stuff like that. Um, I think we see a lot of that all over the place now. Um, communications plans, there's some templates here and some resources and toolkits that can help you put together a communications plan for your employees and for your patrons. Now, yeah. mask policies, testing, waivers, all of the kinds of templates um, that you might need in your responses. All right, a um, couple of other pages. I'm almost done, I promise. Vaccines, vaccines and testing. We're working on expanding our testing section of this site since testing has ramped up so much. I will note that the covidtests.gov site that launched yesterday to get your four free at-home COVID tests is super easy to navigate. Highly recommend if you need tests to use that site. That's linked a little further below. Um, so again, government mandates, this goes through all of your key to NYC stuff um, and all of the vaccine mandate information that you need to know. Of course, it will be updated, um, workplace requirements and things like that. Um, 
and some resources about collecting vaccine documentation, a couple of news and updates, and then general information about the vaccine. Um, who can get vaccinated, vaccine booster stuff, where to find vaccines locally and how to find them. Um, this is really key um, for folks who need to say, get an at-home vaccination or need transportation to vaccine appointments. Um, you can see the mobile schedule as well so that you can find something in your neighborhood. We have background information about the vaccines um, as well, you know, how they work, how they were developed. Um, a recording of our vaccines for Dancers Town Hall that was um, in October of last year. And right, yeah, October. Um, and it was really informative in terms of specific concerns for dancers and the dance community when it comes to COVID vaccines. Bunch of other resources, resources for specific communities, disabled people, children and teens, data, more key to NYC. We had a key to NYC fieldwide call with Commissioner Casals, um, policy implementation things and conflict resolution videos, um, which are also helpful should you encounter um, any resistance to vaccine, vaccine proof of documentation and all of that kind of stuff. Testing, like I said right here, this is the uh, government website that launched yesterday for your free at home COVID tests and a few other pieces of information resources for testing. Um, last page that I'll share is the resources page. This resources page is super comprehensive. There are things that have been compiled through the course of the pandemic uh, by Dance NYC. The table of contents can give you an idea of just the scope of, of all of the resources that we've compiled over time. Government resources and things like that at federal, uh, state, and local levels resources for vaccines, specific resources for facilities, um, some advocacy initiatives around pandemic relief and recovery. Um, the dance field engagement section has information about online dance classes um, and events, things like that. Mental health, self-care and safety, which has been a huge priority for our community um, and sometimes a gap. That is um, a pretty large section of this um, resource page. We also have some financial support things. A lot of these tend to be a little bit more timely, um, but there are some ongoing funds and stuff like that in there. Event management, communications, some additional um, sort of group specific uh, resources. And uh, that's, that's about it on this page. So it continues on below in, in spades. There's lots and lots of links. Um, and it's all searchable, right? So a lot of these pages are really super long with text, but you can command F and search for the things that you need by keywords and things like that. Um, glossary, that's a useful page for like terms and definitions um, that are used within the toolkit and within discourse around COVID-19 more generally. Um, this updates, you can subscribe to updates um, so that you receive like, say, these kinds of updates so that you know, um, periodically we'll send out these updates um, when there's large changes to the toolkit. You can see the last one was on the 17th of January. Um, and I'll finish here. Contact. You can contact us, this email address, reopening at dance.nyc. Um, with any questions, with any feedback on the website, or any resources um, that you've come across that might not be included here. So that is all for today. I'll stop share and return to the world with you all. Um, and any questions, we'll keep monitoring questions in the chat. Um, given the time, I would like to pass things on to Jenny from Give Me, Jenny Thompson, who is here to share a little bit from the dance studio perspective. Take it away, Jenny. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yes, I am Jenny Thompson. For those of you I haven't had the pleasure of meeting yet, I am managing director over at Give Me and I'm leading our reopening efforts. 
Um, I am a cis, white, non-disabled woman, and I use she, her pronouns. And I am tuning in today from the land of the uh, Munsee Lenape people, uh, today known as Manhattan, New York. And I have shoulder length-ish uh, brown hair and I'm wearing a black top with a blurred white uh, background behind me. And first, Sarah, I just wanna say thank you for, for walking us through that. That website is such an incredible resource for us. And it was a real honor for the Gibney team to partner with um, you and the Dance NYC team on that project. And for those of you who don't um, know this, one of the reasons actually that Gibney was invited to partner on that project was because of how multifaceted we are as an organization, which as you can imagine, <laughs> means our reopening efforts have been equally as multifaceted. To give you a sense of the, the different dynamics we've been grappling with as we've reopened, we have uh, two physical locations, um, each of which have different requirements set by building management. So there's that to, to wade through. Um, we also have a resident dance company that you know performs and rehearses locally and abroad. So there's that that dance company model to consider. We are of course a dance studio. We have 23 studios that host rentals and dance training programs and other initiatives seven days a week. Um, we are a presenter. We have five performance spaces and typically do an annual performance season. And we also outside of our own center do quite a bit um, in the by the way of community initiatives in schools and in domestic violence shelters. And there's more, there's more and more I could go into, but um, the point being that each of these sort of areas of work really required their own reopening plan um, as a part of our larger reopening efforts. To add, I guess, just throwing this out there as another layer, a reminder that we are a nonprofit organization too. So especially at the beginning of the pandemic, many, many, many of the decisions we were making around COVID-19 safety were being done in really close partnership with our board of directors. Um, as every one of you on this call I know has experienced, this has been a wildly complicated process. There's been so much change, so much course correction and learning along the way. Um, but I hope that I can be a resource to you today on this call, but also you know, offline. Um, if you're curious, our full reopening plan for Gibney is on our website. It's located on our Plan Your Visit webpage. Um, and this, again, like the digital toolkit Sarah just showed us, this is something that is updated very, very regularly as things shift in the world. But for all of you, I think to offer you a just a general sense of how we have handled reopening, we have admittedly taken a very conservative approach. Um, for instance, we required masks in the studios and at the center at all times, even when that wasn't something that was mandated. Uh, we've also required full vaccination for all ages, uh, even when that was going above and beyond what KEDA NYC stated. And the reason, one of the reasons I should say behind this is because we really had to consider what's unique about Gibney which is, which is the scale of our center as a physical space and the nexus of communities that intersect there. The ripple effect um, that could go on to affect a lot of people's and artists' health and livelihoods in our space was a really serious consideration. And so for us, being as conservative as possible has felt like the responsible thing to do. Um, I will say many, you know, there have been many who have expressed gratitude for that approach, and there are many who thought it's completely ridiculous and over the top, and I, I completely understand. Um, I have found that in those moments of resistance, a simple conversation or dialogue has been incredibly helpful. And actually, more often than not, it's informed us progressing in a different way or finding an alternative solution. So I highly encourage having those tough conversations as you're making some tough decisions um, for you and your own artists. Um, and today we're in a space where we continue to keep our safety protocols pretty conservative. You know, we, we remain a fully vaccinated space. We remain a fully masked space. And we really encourage anyone who is not feeling well at the center to go home and to get tested. Um, 
I'd add that for, because this pandemic is just so messy and uncertain, it has been important to us to offer consistency uh, whenever that's possible. Of course, it is not always possible, but that consistency seems to have meant a lot for our community at large and also for our staff who are the ones that have to remember all the changes and then go off and implement it in the space every day. Um, and I will say that this approach did really benefit us when Omicron entered, because as these stricter mandates have come about at the city and state level, we really haven't had to shift anything yet at Give Me. Of course, things will continue to change and none of this is that easy, but that's where we're at as of today. Um, and I wanna just say, I give so much credit to peers like all of you here who have been answering phone calls or emails or showing up to these calls to have these conversations, it's really, really helpful. Um, and internally at Gibney, we sort of have a similar model. We have a reopening task force. It's 20 some odd staff across eight departments. We meet every week. We talk about what is going well or poorly at the center, what new guidance or mandates have come out and how that impacts our operations and where the community has been asking questions or asking clarity around what we're doing and why. Um, and we navigate, honestly, nearly every challenge in this, in this group setting um, at Gibney. And to give you an example, some of the recent challenges we've been dealing with, there's, there's a handful, but the top two, I think, would be the vaccine mandate and navigating live performance. Um, for us, we are, we're working within the parameters of our building management, who have been very clear about not wanting us to verify vaccinations upon arrival because that crowds the entryway. And they have very clearly specified us using a certain technology. It's called sign in app. And so we use that technology for folks to actually sign into the building, to do a brief health screening and to provide their vaccine information if they have not already done so. You can also supply your vaccine information in advance. Um, and as of right now, we only require vaccine verification once. And once you do it that one time, you continue to have this account and can enter um, Gimby Center. But to just give you a sense, in the first 12 weeks that we require the vaccine mandate, over 10,000 um, vaccines were submitted, which is about the equivalent of nine full-time weeks of work. That's how long it takes to verify that many vaccines. So it's just a huge amount of um, implementation that's being navigated and that we are taking on as a team and are hoping to actually add somebody uh, to our team whose dedicated job will be this, as this appears to be part of our operations in the foreseeable future, at least. And right now we are in the midst of having the discussion around boosters, which I'm sure has come up for some of you. Um, we have already required boosters for some finite groups of staff, uh, some finite groups like our staff, like our faculty, uh, presented artists, audiences, uh, but not yet for the public at large. We, we plan on requiring them for the public at large. This would be you know, in alignment with our conservative approach that we've had this whole time. But we just are trying to determine the timing and we wanna be thoughtful about it. It would be wonderful to have some guidance on how to go about that sort of a mandate, um, we need to consider how to do it equitably. And then from a practical perspective, we need to make sure we have the capacity to actually uh, make that sort of overhaul at the center. Um, so that's the vaccine piece. And then very quickly for the performance piece, this is a part of Gibney that hasn't reopened yet. We were supposed to launch live performance for the first time again this month. And of course, Omicron has put a little bit of a wrench in that. Um, but we decided not to make any sort of big institutional decision uh, about the performance season. And instead we went to the artists and had one-on-one -on -one conversations um, and just tried to meet each group where they were at. You know, did they want to proceed? Did they want to cancel, reschedule, proceed with masks on, et cetera, and just explore those options. So that has led us to a point where we're looking at our first live performance, um, hopefully happening next month. And right now we're in the stages of just listening and having conversations with folks that have been presenting dance for months so that we can learn from them. Um, but as of now, what I can offer is that we're, we're requiring boosters already of those presented artists and audiences. 
I know audiences will remain masked in our space. Um, and we are looking into a testing, uh, offering testing for the presented artists as well. So um, I think with that, I mean, hopefully we'll have some time for you all to ask some questions. I know that's just scratching the surface, um, but I will drop my email in the chat. Please consider me a resource. I'm happy to have a deeper conversation with any of you or your colleagues on, in more specific areas um, of reopening. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny. That is incredibly helpful. Um, we'll hold questions until after our next presenter. And I'll note also, I've taken class at Give Me several times, and I always feel really safe and welcome there. So thank you so much for keeping me dancing. It means more than you might think. Um, all right. So on that note, I'll pass things over to Tamara to share from Naiva's perspective. Hi, I am Tamara Kashecki. I am a board member of the New York Independent Venue Association. I'm also the director of grants and government relations for the St. George Theater Restoration in Staten Island, which is a nonprofit. I am a cisgendered white female um, sitting in a home office that's sort of light gray with a bunch of um, pictures on the wall and a gray shirt. I am currently um, on Penacook land, which is also known as Cheshire County, New Hampshire. So I am very chilly today. <laughs> so um, just a little bit about the New York Independent Venue Association. We were formed um, during the pandemic in response to what was going on. And it was um, the first time that this group of people came together, like many of us in the arts and culture community. So Naiva has over 200 members statewide. They are both for-profit and non-profit live performance venues and promoters and festivals. So we sort of cover a very broad range within our membership. Um, and we have as a performing arts venue and place that people practice their craft really struggled throughout the pandemic, obviously after this, you know, 15, 16 months of being closed. But then what does reopening look like for us? Um, so there's dance spaces in there, but they're not exclusively dance. There's music, there's comedy. You know, there's a lot of food and bar activity at some of these venues. Um, and so what we ended up doing is working with Morgan Dean, who's from Lasher Lewis, and she's phenomenal. She did our reopening guide, which I can drop a link into the chat for that later, um, to really not only figure out what was the changing landscape, but how do we operationalize that in a performance space, which you know is very different from a restaurant or some of these other spaces that had either capacity restrictions um, or museums where people could come in under time ticketing, which doesn't work for live performance. So right now things in terms of reopening seem to be stable. We're under the same key to NYC mandate in New York City as you all are. And then the HERO Act on the state level, um, you know, it's really great to not have as many capacity restrictions to try to figure out what that looks like. You know, can your string quartet sit together or do they have to sit apart just like dancers? It gets really tricky. Um, Excuse me. So that's kind of where we're at right now. Our feeling from communications that we have with the New York State Health Department is that at some point, the definition of fully vaccinated will include boosters. We don't know when exactly that's coming, but um, I think that will come down down the road at some point. Um, we're not really hearing about mandated closures, which is great. Um, so that's a, that's a difference. So it's really nice that I don't think we're going to have mandated closures or capacity restrictions, but what the venues are going through right now um, is in a, one, our staffs are getting sick. So we're, their closures are because we can't staff. So if you have a live performance arts venue and you only have two audio engineers and they're both sick, you're, you're closed. Um, and that's happening quite a bit. Um, artists are canceling tours left and right. I don't know if that's happening in the dance world as much, but we are seeing an enormous amount of tour cancellations um, or people skipping New York right now because of, you know, Omicron. So those two things are impacting us. We ran a survey with our membership in November, and I almost want to run it again, but in November, as of November, ticket sales were down an average of 53% in comparison with 2019. So 
if you combine the ticket sale decrease with the fact that our no-show rate increased from 7% to 22%, meaning people buy tickets and don't come, and then if they don't come, they're not going to buy a pretzel and a soda um, or something, you know, that's where the pain's happening right now. And we're hoping that eases up over the next few months. Um, I, I have lots of advocacy type pieces that I can share, Sarah, and for the greater team um, for reopening. I think you are incredibly thorough. You are in great hands with Dance NYC. Their reopening guideline is amazing and extremely complete. Um, but I'm happy to take any questions if that's helpful. Thank you, Tamara. Very helpful. Um, and yeah, feel free to post your questions in the chat. You can raise your hand or just raise your voice. Um, I can get us started off a little bit. Um, just thinking about what kinds of long-term changes that you, either of you envision um, for like programming, for operations, for touring, especially for artists and organizations that rely on touring for their livelihoods. Um, what do you think, I mean, it's hard to know what that'll look like, um, but what kinds of conversations might be happening right now around those kinds of ongoing and possibly permanent changes? I think if Jenny, if it's okay, I'll jump in. I think this is going to stretch into the three to five year pandemic for the live performing arts industry. I think it's gonna take a long time for things to sort of feel normal again and for tours to resume in a predictable way. Um, and I think it's gonna take that long for the audience confidence to fully return where they're like, I'm gonna go, I'm not gonna get sick. I'm gonna buy a ticket. It's not gonna get canceled the week before or three days before. And that's a real big, um, audience confidence seems to be the big problem as much as um, what artists are interested in. Right now, there's approximately 38 major cities across the US that have vaccine mandates in place. So we're seeing less of artists who say, you know, I won't play for a vax only crowd because there's less places for them to do that, which is, I think it's great. Um, so that's helping the touring piece, right? They're not cutting New York out as much as they were before. Um, or those specific types of art, um, artists. But I do think it's gonna change what, how we will operate in the future. And I think that's actually, would be love to have a bigger conversation with everybody about, um, to say like, well, what do we do if there's another pandemic in the future as an arts industry or as a creative economy? What, how should we be responding in the future, right? Because we can learn from, from these past two years and have a better plan hopefully for next time. Right, uh, Tamara, I couldn't agree more. I think this is, uh, I think at least for me at Gibney, I've noticed we had been putting things in motion, protocols, safety measures in a way without knowing it, but we were doing it in a way that was almost like it was a Band-Aid. And now we've been having a lot of conversations about, we, you know, <laughs> we can't have 20 staff verifying vaccines seven days a week randomly. Like this is actually a job now that, needs to exist at Gibney. So having those conversations, and I think it's happening across our program teams as well um, in this interim space until we get to that more predictable um, zone that Tamara's mentioning. Um, I think there is a lot of consideration around that hybrid model. Is that is that something we're gonna continue to explore? Some some groups love that and are leaning into it and other groups, it's really not suiting their, their needs. And so what do we do for those artists? Um, I think that's an ongoing conversation. Yeah, thank you. And kind of on a related note to that, something that's come up in my work with individual dance workers is, especially during this Omicron surge where there has been a large wave of cancellations, um, similar to you know what we saw at the onset of the pandemic when things were canceled and folks lost most or all of their income. And it seems some of that is happening again. And so I'm wondering in this sort of long view of the pandemic about um, you know, how cancellations versus postponements or cancellation versus mm -hmm. shift to virtual programming, like how those things are being navigated and how um, 
you know, contracts and payment and things like that are, are affected also by the way that we're having to sort of, you know, things get canceled a week or two before. And um, that's not enough time for like folks to pick up additional income and things like that. So have either of you had experience with, you know, navigating postponements, rescheduling or shifts to virtual? I feel like all we do is postpone shows these days <laughs> for years. We've postponed <laughs> some shows at, at my theater three or four times. <laughs> um, and unfortunately we postponed Tony Bennett several times and now he doesn't tour anymore. So we, we missed his last round. Um, so that's definitely happening. And then you deal with some audiences are very understanding and some audiences are a little less understanding. Um, and I think as a, as a creative industry, whether that's for the venues or if it's for the artists and the workers, we need to start really framing that as opportunity cost because that's language that, you know, our elected officials and the people who need to help us with that, I think, understand more than just like we lost a gig. Um, you know, but it's opportunity. Every time you postpone, you've lost the opportunity cost of the night that you had to postpone. And I, th I think we're going to see more postponements throughout 2022 because I don't know if the artist confidence is there. And being that the ticket sales are so low, then the artists are more likely to, to want to postpone to maybe a, a date will be a better, better um, opportunity for them. But then all the support workers or the background band or the background dancers who aren't the headliner, yeah, there's, there's, there's definitely work to be done around that. Definitely. Honestly, we're seeing, we're seeing similar. I will say in the conversations we had with artists, um, over the, the first six weeks of 2022, the majority did make the choice to, um, to postpone. Um, there was only maybe one, one or two groups that decided to just cancel um, for the time being. So the postponement seems, seems to be where we're at right now, but I, it becomes that ripple effect question of what if we have to postpone again? And you know that, that has a huge impact, a negative one. It's yeah. also staff time, right? Every time you postpone, mm -hmm there's a lot of staff time that goes into that postponement and not only postponing the people who who need to work the show but moving all the tickets over and making sure audience knows or handling refund requests um so there's a there's an enormous cost to postponement um is to the to, to the whole system you know as well yeah i imagine postponements have an effect on like um cultural tourists are you know, tourists that are in the city for a limited amount of time. And when you postpone something, they're not able to attend like a local person, audience member might be able to. So um, yeah, I imagine that's very difficult to navigate. I wanted to also touch a little bit on um, the virtual component, because I think something that I've been hearing from folks is that it's it's hard to maintain both in person and for, it's twice the work, you know, to maintain programs in both spaces. And you know, Jenny, as you mentioned, it works really well for some people and not for others. Um, I know that I have shifted quite a bit in my own engagement with dance virtually during the pandemic. Um, but one really key point about virtual programming is that it opens up accessibility for folks with disabilities that, you know, don't have the confidence yet to be able to navigate the live performance um, or dance programming world. Um, and so I'm, I'm curious how um, or if you've been able to address that virtual programming in terms of broader access and um, accessibility for disabled people specifically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's there. There is such a value add to embracing some form of the virtual performance or programming for the reasons you just said. Offering accessibility is huge. Um, also, offering reach and exposure for artists beyond beyond the local audience. Um, I know we were seeing a lot at the beginning when we were having strictly uh, virtual dance classes and training programs that it was, it was fascinating to see how many folks were tuning in from other countries and across the US, as opposed to the New York City concentration that we're so used to on the day to day. So there is that, um, that advantage that, that is absolutely worth considering, you know, when considering those options. 
So outside my, my roles that I perform with Naiva and at my job, um, last year I was a policy research fellow at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, and I worked with a policy professor and a methodologist and we specifically studied the um, differential impact of COVID-19 and federal response policies on nonprofit organizations in New York City. And one of the most interesting finds that we had that we weren't even specifically looking for was the pivot to virtual and how nonprofit arts organizations specifically found it as a way to continue to serve and continue to execute their mission, right? So this provision of service. And there was a 750% increase in virtual programming usually at great cost to the organization. Um, so it, it absolutely, sorry, my puppy, um, it absolutely served uh, this amazing purpose. Um, we're hoping to go in and do a second round of survey data to see if it's continuing as we're going more into a hybrid model. But one of the things that we found, especially um, everyone in New York City is probably familiar with the SUCASA program, which is cultural programming for seniors. And they found ways to do virtual programming for seniors who are obviously not usually extremely tech savvy. So whether that was over the phone, whether that was uh, some sort of device, really interesting. We're hoping to dive into that deeper. And I'll, I'll be interesting to see how we can use the virtual programming piece as an access accessibility expansion mm -hmm. at a time when people are maybe not as excited about being virtual all the time because it can be a little exhausting as well. So I think there's some unanswered questions there, but some really great data to look at. For sure. Um, I think one of the other questions that comes up with virtual programming is how to best generate revenue from it, right? Like, what are some of the sentiments around um, paying for virtual access to a performance when you had intended to go in person or, you know, payment structures for classes tuning in virtually versus in person? Um, are there any learnings that you've had? I think some of our venues have been successful at monetizing their offerings and some were doing it as a way to keep just sort of in the game or if they were nonprofit, maybe as a way to execute grant programming. Um, but I don't think it's been an enormous source of revenue because it does come at great cost if you're going to do it well. Um, but you know, that, that cost benefit analysis may shift. I'm not sure. Jenny, do you have a, a thought on that? Yeah, now you're hearing my puppy. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, we, you know, we, we offered different options. We kind of tested and piloted different approaches to this at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, when it was all still new. And so there was a level of appetite for it as opposed to the exhaustion that I think many can feel around that work now. Um, we, we, we tried things like, um, like pay what you can, having different um, scaled options where folks could choose whatever amount um, suited them, framing it as a, a, a donation, as opposed to like a ticket fee, a donation to support the artist being presented, um, things like that, it, it worked to a, to a little extent, but to your point, Tamara, it wasn't hugely revenue generating and it certainly didn't match what um, the power of live performance and live programming um, can bring in. So it's, it's an option, I would say, but it is, um, you know, it, it's, it's hard to think of it as a sustainable revenue model long-term. We like to say you can't take out live performance, right? You just, it's just not take out. For sure. Right. I, I have been yeah. feeling that every time I go to see a show or go to take class. So folks, please continue to support your local dance studios, your local independent performance venues. They are out there and they are working so hard. Um, and we appreciate every single one of you. Um, in the interest of time, I will leave a minute open um, for anyone to ask questions. Again, questions can go in the chat. Feel free to raise your hand or raise your voice. Um, if you have you know, resources or events to share as well, you're welcome to share those in the chat and we can share them in our follow-up email. Sarah, I will jump in and say, I don't have this resource for everyone yet, but once I do, I will share it with you. We're putting together excuse me, a database of international vaccine cards. 
um, so that if you have international tourists and they don't have a CDC card, what does the one from Poland look like? Or what is, you know, so once that's put together, I'll be sure to share that, but we're, that's a project that we're currently working on. Thank you. That is super helpful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, for, for all of the ways that vaccine cards look. All right, y'all. I think that concludes our panel portion. I'll, I'll lead us in a little outro. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you, Tamara, oh, thank for you. being here and for sharing all of these great resources. Um, we'll share everything that the two of them shared in our follow-up email. I'll send that out tomorrow. Um, also, a big thanks to Nola Sporn smith who's been here on the call, dropping links in the chat. Um, she has also been invaluable administrative and emotional support for me on this reopening toolkit project. So huge thanks to Nola. Um, thank you to our accessibility providers, again, Maria and Candace and Bonnie, all from Sign Nexus. Your support is truly invaluable. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of the call, the fieldwide call is moving to monthly for the time being. Our department is having some staffing shifts. You know that Greg left. I'm here holding down the fort. Um, so our next call is slated for February 17th. But I'll note that we'll leave room for rapid response calls if our advocacy agenda demands that. So um, you know, keep track of your inbox. You'll get an email from me. If we have a rapid response call, you'll get the reminder emails. Um, for the calls the week um, before. Um, and in addition, you know, we'd like your input on these calls. You can take two to three minutes to fill out a short feedback survey on the fieldwide call. We'll drop a link to the chat with that survey um, just so we can better address your needs on these calls. Um, again, I'll send the notes with resources tomorrow. There's a whole bunch of them. It is grant season. Um, and feel free to drop any questions, ideas, resources in the chat as we close, and we will Zoom you next month. Thank you so much and have a great night.